going. So up to this point, we have talked all about ions, their role in ionic bonding and forming ionic compounds. We've talked about all the traditional elements and gotten into how the transition metals are different. So all of these involve one atom. Now, when we make compounds, we've been discussing that all of these ionic compounds are neutrally charged. There are actually some compounds, not ionic, that have more than one atom that actually do have a charge to them. They're called polyatomic ions. So then, what we want to know is, how exactly are these polyatomic ions different than the monatomic ions? Well, for starters, the monatomic ion is just the ion of a single atom meaning that it's an ion of just one atom, so like sodium, fluoride, oxide, whatever. In a polyatomic ion, these are ions that have more than one atom. Usually there's some kind of combination of a nonmetal with oxygen, not always, but here are some examples. Sulfate. This has one sulfur, four oxygen molecules. This compound here has an overall minus two charge. It is not neutral. Phosphate, PO4, with a minus 3 charge. Nitrate, hydroxide, ammonium. Just a few of the many polyatomic ions that are actually out there and that exist. So, polyatomic ions are basically a compound that have an overall charge. They still behave like ions. So, these are all still treated as cations with this, uh, sorry, as anions with this cation exception here. So, uh, when we go to name these polyatomic anions, these names have already been assigned and they're assigned based on how common they are uh, and the fact that some of these elements can actually combine in different ratios. What I mean by that is that these, these polyatomic anions that have an 8 ending to them are the ones that actually appear the most common. So basically the ratio of the two elements that appear the most common. So SO4 this 1 to 4 ratio of sulfur to oxygen appears the most, so it has the sulfate ending. Then you have phosphate, the 1 to 4 phosphorus to oxide ratio, and then nitrate, the 1 to 3. The ending does not tell you how many oxygens there are. What it does tell you is that this compound is the most common of that ratio. These ratios can vary. And when you have one less oxygen in that ratio, it takes on an ite ending. So this is not to be confused with the ide we have been talking about. Okay, it's ite, I-T-E. So sulfate, when it has one less oxygen, is called sulfite. Similar to phosphate, one less oxygen phosphate, and nitrate, one less oxygen nitrite. So by having one less oxygen, these polyatomic anions, their ending changes from an ate to an ite. So these endings can actually help distinguish these polyatomic ions from their monatomic versions. What I mean by that is, take for example, sulfur. The sulfur 2 minus anion has the name sulfide. But the SO4 minus 2 polyatomic anion has the name sulfate. So it's a very subtle difference, mainly just the endings differing, but it is something to pay attention to in order to distinguish it. It's very, very easy to mix these up, especially when we're talking about the ite ending, because the ite sounds very, very similar to the i. So just kind of keep that in mind, look for those endings. An eight or an ite, basically anything with a T, tells you that it's polyatomic, which means that it's not going to be that monatomic version. So when you name the polyatomic ions, exactly the same as the ionic compounding that we've been doing before, cation, anion name, but these polyatomic ions have already been given the name, so you just kind of use the name of the polyatomic ion. So in this case here, we have sodium and sulfate together in this compound, so the name of it is sodium sulfate. Here you can see that SO4 polyatomic ion. So what you really just want to be able to look for is spotting these polyatomic ion groups. So SO4, PO4, OH, NO3, and so forth are just some of these polyatomic ions to kind of start recognizing because when you see them, you have to name them by that group. 
So just a word of caution here, when you do write the formula including polyatomic ion compounds, sometimes you have to use parentheses in order to indicate how many polyatomic ion groups there are. What I mean by that is taking this example, magnesium hydroxide, MgOH parentheses 2, and MgOH without the parentheses in 2. These two, although they may look similar, are actually not the same. By having the parentheses, much like in math, you are kind of separating this portion from the entire equation. So by putting a parentheses around the OH, you are indicating this is a hydroxide group, that the O and the H belong together, and that I have two of those groups. Without the parentheses, it basically just kind of tells you the O and the H are two separate things, not a group, and that I have one oxygen and two hydrogens, rather than two OHs together. Okay, So by having parentheses, you can kind of show what should be grouped together and what shouldn't. So it's kind of just worthwhile to keep that in mind. You really only need the parentheses whenever you're going to have more than one of those groups, um, but it is still kind of helpful to have them there. Um, you really do need that to kind of show that it's different from the rest of the formula. So now let's practice here. With these pairs of ions, once again, write the correct formula for the ionic compound and name those compounds. And here are those answers. So you can see again here that the polyatomic name is only used for the anion. Here it's same exact procedure, cation name, then anion name. 